about football and all that, you know, with uh, people, you know, taking money and backhanders, uh, there's one thing about Ron, he's the most, you know, cleanest man in soccer, and would never take a backhander, in fact, when at Christmas, uh, Greenhalls gave him a barrel of beer, and he wouldn't drink it, because he was a bung in it. <laughs> I watched that video the other night, by the way, that's, you know, after Sammy Davis and Dean Martin. Is as good as us? Well, no, 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 but they're only human. They're only human. Who's your best singer? He is. He's the best entertainer. I, I, I'm a backing group. Ron Atkinson and his easy beats. <laughs> That's what I used to call your teams. The easy beats. <laughs> the vanilla. Aston Vanilla. Everybody licks them. Everybody licks them. Uh, you know what? How unlucky you can be. Yeah. I just signed a good deal with Frank Sinatra to be on his next Jewett's album. <laughs> Yeah. For reasons yeah, better known, he can't. He won't. He, got, he won't do them like you know. That's typical of my luck, you know. Near misses all the while. No, I, I felt that all with your singing career. You've been very unlucky. Very unlucky. Yeah. Is it my voice that makes me unlucky? <laughs> <laughs> it's a long way to go to Wembley, but we'll get there. We know. You got this reputation for being an oddball manager, anyway, a bit eccentric. <laughs> what about all these silly runs you make down the wing when you score? You never run that far when you played. <laughs> what started all that? You're right. I don't know, mate. You know, I'm, I'm just a supporter at heart, and I get excited when we score, and I just do whatever I do. You'd been all right with me in my first month at the Villa. Yeah. Wouldn't have had to do much running that month. One every it? game. No, we had, score a goal. No, we had month of the goal competition. <laughs> <laughs> One of them things it was. I mean, since you've been here, what is it, two and a half years now, you've had a, you've had a, a great track record, and... Of course, you had the problems at the start of the year with this centre forward, this the, the flying Dutchman, or the, the non-flying Dutchman as he should be now. Um, saw sort a of quote attributed to you, and whilst I don't always believe the press, you said, Cloughy would have found it harder. I'll tell you what, just one thing. I think Cloughy would have suspended that Van Hooydonk right from the top of that standover <laughs> <laughs> and let the fans shoot at him. Remember when you signed me for West Brom as a player? I'll never, ever forget. I'd never often been dropped in my life. And I remember going in one Saturday and we're going to play something. I think it was Ipswich or something like that. It was Ipswich. I'm pretty sure it was Ipswich. 
And we've gone in and you pulled me to the side and you said, you're not playing today. And I said, you what? It was Blackburn. Was it Blackburn? And he said, you're not playing today. I said, I'm not what? I said, who's playing? He said, George Riley. I said, what? He said, George Riley's playing. I said, you can't be serious, Gavin. And he's going, listen, I've, I've got to play George Riley. I said, why have you got to play George Riley? He says, because somebody's coming to watch him today. And if I can sell him, I'll sell him. So, <laughs> and I never forget, you something left me at the team and I couldn't catch my breath. And I'm sitting there, at the half time, you, you hooked him off and then got me on. <laughs> they were never going to buy him after uh, that anyway. Yeah. No. This image of uh, Medallion Man, which he's always had, you know, you know, uh, Cougar Ron, right? Um, he did used to wear a lot of jewellery years ago until the day when he went to uh, Mallorca with the kids. And the kids buried him in the sand. And he couldn't find him. So he had to get a metal detector. <laughs> <laughs> he seems to like the jewellery and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone said to me, you and that Ron Atkinson with all your jewellery. I went, what jewellery? I ain't got any. Can't afford it. Ron took it off me at cards. <laughs> Disaster. I've always had the theory goalkeepers playing goal because they've never been good enough to play anywhere else on the park. At school, they'd always be the last pick. The big problem is they think they can play. Now, here we see another facet of goalkeepers. Nice little back pass, no problem. Alan Kelly, oh, lovely. Beats one, beats two. Oh, where's it gone? In the net. That wasn't Tony Curry. Now, you've got to feel sorry for this fellow. He's done everything right, measured it. Serves him right. But look again, he measures it. All the time in the world, no problem at all. Number seven shouldn't even be competing for it. Now he's looking for someone to blame. Now here's my old mate Prezi, who actually is a good outfield player, as he proves here. Good first touch, second touch not so good. Problems, Prezi. I think the number 11 here is out of order. No right to charge that one in. But look at the abuse he gives the keeper. Not as much as the keeper will get when he gets back in the dressing room, by the way. Here's some first-class technique on defending a free kick. Well, almost. Here we're going to see two goals from a Wickham Bristol Rovers game. Bristol Rovers goalkeeper Parkin goes down, eyes on the ball, body behind it, pull back on the line covering. Everything seems to be right apart from one thing again. The ball's where it shouldn't be. Now it's Wickham's turn to defend. Hyde's got that one. No, he hasn't. They must both have the same goalkeeping coach. power shot wasn't it have a look at this one goalkeeper doing his best to make sure that he doesn't concede a corner brilliant agility look at the second recovery brilliant agility again oh all of a sudden there's an empty net apart well, where's the goalie now this is perfect AstroTurf He's teed it up for the fella. Just look at that. Holds it nicely for him. It's like a rugby shot, that. Thank you very much. Eyes down. And I've got a funny old feeling I might have knocked this one in.
Oh, he runs all right. I'm, oh. Well, he's all right when he's asleep, anyhow. Yeah, yeah, he's fine. Would you be a chairman if you could make it? I would want to be as rich as employer, well. da, da, Deadly Doug as a manager. Oh. <laughs> Role reversal. Hey, would I give him plenty? I'll tell you what. <laughs> the chairman of Aston Villa, three days, oh, three days before, um, said, I think Ron Atkins was one of the best three managers in the world. Now, I automatically assumed that the other two would probably have been Alex Ferguson and somebody like, I don't know, Trapattoni. Yeah. I didn't realise he meant Brian Little and somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Three days later, he'd been here. Brian Little in here. He sent a fax. Well, I put this in my programme notes. And it was to the effect of, like, I'm many years in the game and I've not found anyone, any chairman ever, more supportive or more, co more cooperative <laughs> than my present chairman. Um, because of his experience as an ex-player, I also often use him as a sounding board for tactics and selection. Sounding board. It's true, isn't it? No, we called him the ironing board. <laughs> Not a president. <laughs> yeah, but can you remember how he pulled me into his office all these times? Yeah. And I was working at Sky at the same time. And he used to say, Andy, I'm very concerned at the amount of times you're appearing on Sky television. But what he didn't realise is that Sky <laughs> yeah, showed that yeah. many repeat programmes. <laughs> that he thought I was going on all the time. <laughs> Without a doubt, I seem to attract a certain kind of chairman. <laughs> <laughs> now, they nearly all end up inside, I must say, but there, but the grace goes on. Um, I started off, as you know, at Dunstable, with the oh, famous oh, Keith Cheeseman, oh, 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 you yeah, forgot all yeah, about yeah. that. I mean, he was a terrific chairman, but, uh, and he enabled me to buy three players off you, and we'd been... He must have been league. a good chairman. Oh, he was a good chairman. He, uh, we'd been bottom of the league for nine years, but those three players I bought off you, Trevor Pett, John Hawkesbury, George Cleary, helped us get promotion, score 105 goals and change it round. And he looked after all the lads, that's all I can say. But unfortunately, it was somebody else's money. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't I'm, you talk about chairman like that, because oh, I was one Oh, one. sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I forgot that one. <laughs> How did you find up being on the other side of the fence? What were you like with your manager then? Um, it, it, on a serious side, I, I, I think that perhaps we should all have uh, six months on it. They should uh, also try to be a manager uh, too. Well, I think most Germans should get six months. <laughs> I do, honestly. I think that would be, be a hell of a shout. Now, the hell I had nine years with Stan Flashman, I don't know. What I did do was my social life has never been better. I went to see Frank Sinatra. I went to see all the J Johnny Mathis, Frank Sinatra, everybody I went to see. But he only got hold of me at the last minute when he had two together. Two that together. Was spare. <laughs> but um, he, he had an unbelievable, I mean, he was the most generous man one minute, football fanatic, and then he was evil can evil the next. He was Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But I mean, it's well known he used to come in the dressing room with a load of reddies, you know, for the lads. And I used to go around the table and get paid three or four times. So <laughs> <I was quite laughs> <happy. laughs> One end rotated. Yeah. <laughs> when the music stops. Great character, oh, yeah. and uh, he sacked me so many times I lost count. Have you ever heard the vote of confidence? No, I never got that far. But <laughs> <laughs> I just got bent right. straight away. <laughs> <laughs> they, never, they never give me the vote of confidence, I've never, but I'm, I've been lucky not having it, it's wrong, because every time somebody gets it, they get the wallop. Yeah. Oh, 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 it's an own goal! It's an own goal! That lad from Fulham certainly not heading in the right direction. Here's one of my favourites. Jamie Pollock showing some of the best bits of skill seen at Main Road since the legendary Colin Bell. These next two clips feature the team from the other side of Manchester, the Reds of United. Here we see Mel Donaghy calmly slotting the goalkeeper. Trouble was, it was his own goalkeeper again. I wonder if it was that sort of clinical finish that eventually made Chelsea sign him. Lasso, can Chelsea find a way through? Well, Lasso might. Well struck. And the own goal! Henning Berg! Scandinavian calamity. 
Lasso's drive spilt by Schmeichel and Berg just couldn't get out of the way. The goal scorers thrive on quality balls into the penalty box. And Thomas of Brighton's no exception. Trouble is he must have rocks for brains because that happens to be the wrong end again. Perfect cross. Attacks it, does nothing wrong here. Well, there's an old saying in football, you know, when in doubt, put the ball in row Z. Experience can be vital in soccer, particularly in defensive areas. Watch Gary Shelton here, he makes no mistake. With Kevin Moran around, Glenn Hoddle certainly didn't need any help from Eileen Drury. It must be moments like that when Kevin wished he'd stuck to Gaelic football. This own goal by Peterborough's Mick Bodley was part of an exciting ten-goal thriller between Peterborough and Barnett. Fortunately for Mick, his teammates managed to knock in nine at the right end of the field. I'll leave this last one to commentator Hugh Johns. Oh, 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 it's an own goal! It's an own goal! Walker! Oh, gosh! Total disaster! Going back to Sheffield, you know, you did a few things that I would never have dreamt of. And I do most things, I've done most things in my career, but there's one particular clip we've got of you. Oh, there's yeah. no way in the yeah. world that I would even have endeavoured or attempted to do it. Yeah. Not for a million, well, maybe for a million quid, aye. aye. Yeah, I remember, you remember it? Yeah, I remember that one. It was the end of the season and uh, we'd stayed up and everybody that was happy, we knew we'd stayed up before and it was a sort of occasion in Sheffield particularly where at the end of the season you go around and see the fans and the players were there and I was out with them and, you know, it's one of those where I took off my, you know, my sweat top and threw it to the fans, you know, that, with your initials on and then the t-shirt come off and, you know, I was going to leave it at that and then one fan's come on and, you know, lad, I remember him saying, come on Harry, let's have your shorts on. I'm going, no, I can't, you know, no, please, let's have your shorts, please, let's have your shorts and, you know, he's kept on in the end. I've, I've whipped him off and of course I'm standing there in these, uh, you know, diabolic underpants, which the missus has never forgiven me for. She'd be well pleased with that, wouldn't she? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I was there and all of a sudden, you know, you didn't realise. And when I come off, I thought, Christ, you know, there I am down to the underpants. What's this going to look like? So next day, because there I am, dancing around looking like a right burke. Yeah, we've also got a few snaps of uh, one of the young birds that, uh, <laughs> well, younger birds at uh, Chef U. Um, and apparently she did the same. So I suppose you and her could profess, you know, really to have started, or perhaps late, laid the foundations for the, the movie that was later on to be almost <laughs> as big a success as you were in Sheffield, The Full Monty. Yeah, well, she had The Full Monty, you know, hers was Sunny at the Sea. I'm not sure mine would have been, oh, but... You're, uh, too, you're too modest, Alex. Yeah, you're that's modest. right. You're too no, modest. Yeah, it must be Sunny in the water in Sheffield or the, at the air. Then I was never there long enough. <laughs> We're about to see some of the pupils from the Ronnie Rosenthal School of Finishing. First of all, Michael Holt of Preston in the Red Pace Brigade. But there's more. Sean Gota from Manchester City achieves the near impossible. How the hell did he get it over the bar from there? Well, that might not be the worst. Have a look at Samasa Abu of West Ham. Now he's got a little nickname, Boo Boo Boo. I think there might have been booing then a little bit. Perhaps it was a bit far out. Now we watch Carl Schutt. A little bit of a rebound, a little bit of a ricochet. Is that Carl Schutt? Or shut out.
Now let's have a look at Blackpool's Andy Priest. Ball's in the melee. Augie on a fast crawl, manages to claw it back. But Andy Priest, from four yards out, should you have scored? Perhaps it fell to your wrong feet. Oh dear, oh Lord. Now this is a certain goal, isn't it? Squares it up and in comes Rory Hamill, knock it. Oh no. Good job Kevin wasn't around then. I don't think you'd have lasted too long. You wouldn't have got your Christmas shopping at Harrods. Now just when Doncaster Overs thought things couldn't get much worse, have a look at this. Now earlier we saw Steve Bruce all full of smiles, but football can be a funny game. Now Will Brucey plays cards right here. Bruce! Oh, he's missed it! Oh, dear me. Well, he'll have a laugh about that eventually, but not at the moment. Because Cantona put that on a plate. Steve Bruce had made such a lot of ground to get into that position. Cantona goes away from Williams, low across the goal. How could he miss? Well, he did. Go on, what's the worst miss you've seen since you've been at this football club? Oh, we, got a, we got a picture of it. Yeah, it's coming back very vividly. Uh, I think it was at Reading last season, Tilly Boy's game, and uh, Steve Stone was through and uh, he's just gone round the goalkeeper and uh, he could have put it in with anything and uh, Steve missed kicked and uh, you know it was all there to be seen. Van Hoydon, great link up, the flag stays down, Campbell is onside with Stone in support and Steve Stone runs his goal, oh, no! He was lined up for a goal! He was really gutted about it and uh, you know in well, of course, obviously, you know, the boys have ribbed him and everybody's ribbed him, and I kept on saying that's going to be on television for years, Stoney. Great link up, watch Stone for the scissor run. And Campbell says, go on then, Stoney, stick it in. Eight yards out. Oh, dear. Why, aye, man, he'll be very, very disappointed with this one. Oh, he could even have taken a touch. It's easy to say for me, but goodness me, you won't get any better chances than that. And Steve Stone knows it. I suppose you consoled him. Oh, yeah, definitely. Put my arm around him. <laughs> <laughs> no enthusiasm, no zest. They're telling a right fullback to keep taking you on. They're going to tackle on him yet because you're casual, stupid, and it sets the whole tone. It, it brings them into a game that had no chance. The lack of effort there is unbelievable. Remember when Graham Taylor was on the, on the rise with um, Lincoln when they were coming through yes, the field? Yes, yes, indeed, yeah. I can remember going there with Cambridge, and Graham was all into that group therapy, yeah. motivation, yeah. And bonding, and all that yeah. stuff. And he used to have a and I knew all about it. It's when you do the daft things, isn't it? Yeah. And they, they used to have this little huddle in the dressing room before they, before they went out. And they yeah. always thin dressing rooms, you know, and yeah. it would, the noise would come into your dressing room yeah. quite clearly. I remember him giving it, and I got all my boys up on the, uh, up on the benches. And they all get down. We can just about squint through and see them all going, and it's like, yeah, we will win. We will win. That's like going, like, no, you won't. No, you won't. <laughs> Brilliant. I mean, oh, no. I remember when you had players at Aston Villa, you, them two Chinese players, you know, uh, uh, Wong, and you put Wong on that wing. <laughs> wing on that wing. <laughs> and then wing on that wing, and then they got mixed up. Wong went on that wing, and Wing went on that wing, and you said you're on the one wing. <laughs> <laughs> you remember the goalkeeper's name in that team? I can't remember the Chinese keeper we had. What was his name? Black <laughs> Men. <laughs> remember we played Swindon in the FA Cup, down there. And then yeah. we got 2-0 we got up, I think it was. Yeah. And then on our side, Tony Daly was playing right hand side, you remember? And he let the runner go. That yeah. was Tony's want in those days. And this guy went down the wing, fizzed the bar across. The boy came in such a bunch and scored 2 1. Yeah. So the big man says to me, When we go in here, I'm going to give it well done, lads. It was absolutely sensational. No problem. We were absolutely great. I want you to have Tony Daly. And I've gone, oh, <coughs> all right, boss. <laughs> you know, that's, you know, that's the way it works. I mean, one, so we've gone in, the, the gaffers, you were like, ah, hey, what a result, lads. This is not an easy place to come. Fantastic result. You've ground it out. That was a great performance. Well done. Okay, and they're all chucked away. Oi, a lot of you, sit down. Just calm your jets. Hold on a minute. You, and I pointed at Tony, do you remember? I said, if we'd have lost that game, you would never, ever have kicked another ball for this club again. That was it. What you did was a cardinal sin of football. And I went in, and I thought he would just take it, Tony. But then he started crying, didn't he? And I thought, oh my God, I've got to do that. 
And I thought, I've gone that far, but I couldn't, but I wanted to just take him and cuddle him and say I didn't mean it. The gaffer told me to say it. And we won the lot with a minute to go and Gary Pendley did a, give a daft call and yeah. uh, the score. And again, watching, and I noticed they were all plastic cups. So I waited and I went, and I smacked them all up in the air like you can't lose a game like that, you know, just yeah. effect really, but I, they all said, for Christ, she throws cups in, but I knew what I was doing and they were all plastic anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never had any cups at Birmingham. No. Never had really. any silver ones. No. <laughs> <laughs> I introduced you to the players and they was all looking down, hello, hello, you know, they couldn't look you in the eye. So anyway, when we got to the hotel, I called them all down, seven o'clock we was eating, I said, right, lads. I said, I'll be at the front of the hotel and if anybody's back, before two o'clock, you're fine, two weeks' wages. Get out and enjoy yourself. Go to the discos, forget about the game and all that. So, of course, Vic Jobson, who had flew down, he couldn't understand what I was saying. He says, Baz, we're bottom of the league by seven points. We've only got nine games left. I went, don't worry, Vic, you can't lose, can you? You're not winning now. Let's try something else. <laughs> Ron, I promise you, they went to nightclubs. They come in two o'clock or after. They had a good sleep in the morning. We went out and we beat Sunderland 4-1. So where's your logic in that? Oh dear, why I man, he'll be very, very disappointed with this one. This is the section that we would call the equivalent of the golfing air shot. Bristol City can consider themselves so unlucky that there's a divot there. The problem is he's wearing a green jersey. Watch Nottingham Forest build this attack up. A long ball over the top, but there's Paul Futcher, no problem. Back to his goalie. Oh, there is a problem. One of the great names in goalkeeping is Banks. Unfortunately, this is Blackpool Stephen, not the legendary Gordon. I love players with flair, those that can do a trick. But I think the goalkeeper of Lincoln, Barry Richardson's overdoing it a little bit this time, don't you? And you know players can be cruel. Look at them taking the mickey. That's out of order. Now let's see the Preston goalkeeper here, Tepi Milanum, giving his impression of a centre-half, a non-existent centre-half. Well, Tepi's finish. I hope that doesn't spell curtains for him. Now let's see Mark Prudo give his impression of a golfer's air shot. Now, surely the world's number one doesn't have any problem with the sort of situations we've been looking at. Oh, Schmeichel, John Henry, first goal against Manchester United for Barnsley. He's done it. Schmeichel, a real howler. Wow, that's incredible. You're always risking it, but it's a long way surface. The ball doesn't often set off. I can only think this one does, Mark. He just sits on the half volley. Wow. You have absolutely no excuse. Even if you're a goalkeeper, it's on the half volley. It's what you would call a dolly clear. He just comes right across it. Now let's take a look at this for teamwork. No problem at all at the moment. There is now. It's a big one. Now this is the sort of thing that gives managers headaches, not to mention your own centre half. Now when there's an injury, you can always rely on the old St John's Ambulance Brigade. Oh, that's bad handling. Has he been watching our goalkeeping clips? Is he in the box around of it? That will be the controversy tonight. Was he in or outside the penalty area? He's had enough. Oh, he's off. If he's out for Christmas, he'll certainly get a job in the local pantomime. Need a parrot on his shoulder though.
on the ball. With five minutes of first half left, not counting injury time. Oh, and he almost caught Swan unaware. That was a cute one by Ron Atkinson. Well, he's been in the game long enough. Played against you once, I think, oh yeah. And I always remember Ron playing. You know, it's, it's tremendous. Uh, oh, you thought I was going to say skill then? <laughs> <laughs> You're only human. Enthusiasm for the game. <laughs> and thought he could shoot. He used to shoot every time he got the ball. 30 yards down the hill. You knew what was going to happen. He used to say, he's going to shoot. Let him, let him have the ball. <laughs> every free kick. I love the free kick. People used to say... Yeah. Come up, lads, and say, what are we going to pull? I said, pull your foot out of the way, I'm going to have a shot. <laughs> <laughs> and Les Allen, the manager, saying, uh, Sancho's playing right back, you've got to watch him because he does that. Ron Atkinson uh, does this. And I said, no, he doesn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> cool name, you the tank. We all said, oh, the tank's playing. Mind you, I could tell why the size of him might be. <laughs> could have done with losing a bit of weight, really. Well, nothing, to do, great with, player, well, nothing to do with pace. No. Um, <laughs> well, the, the pace of a tank, yeah. Basically, I suppose it was my style of play. Um, swashbuckling, um, artistic, skillful. <laughs> I've never known an artistic tank, have you? <laughs> well, good for a tank, right? <laughs> I, know, I know you... By know. the way, Jim, if they ever called you the tank, I know that you'd be no. capacity to hold <laughs> liquid. <laughs> well. I hope, I hope them, them shorts are extra large. These are not proper shorts. Anyway, hey, that's the we're playing all the shots today. Smith is in goal for them. <laughs> looks, like, <laughs> looks like something off the Benny Hill show. These are two lads that owe me a great deal of gratitude for the rest of their lives. <laughs> we were a midfield trio. Um, these were the two dogs in midfield. I was the artist. I was the playmaker. I was the man. But I couldn't have done it. Well, probably would have done. But without the help of these two, my brother Graham and John Chuka, who is a fine player, John. The only thing I've got against him was he broke my record of appearances at the club. Mind you, he had 25 years. He was entitled to. What? Do you remember that game in 63, 1963, when it won one of your early games, Hugh, when I nearly played a bad pass? Yeah, oh, no. I, I can't remember that. I actually took the blame saying it was a bad crossfield ball, but I knew people didn't realise just how slow you were. You, at the time, you were lightning slow, weren't you? You didn't have to develop. I developed a little bit, yeah. 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 I don't know where, but yeah. I did. The thing is, I never knew how fast Graham was, did you? No, I'm sorry, Muir. Correct. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who started calling him the tank? Rommel. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was on the beach this day. Well, it was a big beach. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, was it a supportive, I suppose, was it? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. It was a sort of, it was a sort of adulation, a hero worship, wasn't it? I yeah. suppose that's the best way you can describe it. <laughs> it was a team of endearment. Was it? <laughs> 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 it wasn't a spelling mistake, was it? <laughs> And have you ever seen a sloppier goal than that? Coming up in this segment, a series of defensive mishaps that would send Alan Hansen and George Graham bonkers. And John Gittins. Torquay's answer to Franz Beckenbauer. Or is he? Now this is collective defending. Terry Venables' Crystal Palace against Barnsley. It's moments like this when Terry must have imagined he was back at Tottenham. And no set of defensive mishaps would be complete without a little look at something going on at Main Road. And here it is, Jeff Whitley. No problem. Nice. Oh, Marcel has nipped him. Round the keeper, tucked away. Marcel thinks his problems are all over. No, they're not, because that might be the first real tackle seen at Main Road since Mike Doyle packed him. And 
Now, there's no bigger fan of Manchester City than Stoke City's number two, Ali Pickering. But even this is carrying support too far. Next, we're about to see two crazy kamikaze pieces of defending by Sheffield Wednesday. Oh, no, that's a dreadful mistake, and it's given an equaliser to Brian McClare. I said, oh, no, because Paul Warhurst just did not see the lurking menace of Brian McClare, and the United striker has brought his side level within two minutes of her strike. Just watch this one, how lazily Warhurst laid it back so lazy in fact that it was a gift for McClare, a gift he could hardly refuse first losing out to Parker and it was a fair challenge oh and here's McClare inside the area Giggs teeing up Robson Brian Robson can make it 2-1 he's still got a chance oh and it's going into the net is it what an extraordinary mess it's 2-1 to Manchester United and have you ever seen a sloppier goal than that It was quite bizarre, and Gates there, Robson on the left foot, couldn't force it through, it struck Palmer, then it was Nielsen who diverted it back inside of the upright, a miskick by poor old Warhurst again, and McClare's tap-in makes it 2-1 to United. But while you're only one goal to the good, anything can happen. The Derby do seem to be getting more and more space, more and more attacking movements going again. This is Sturridge! He's been reading comics. They, they had um, John Spencer. Remember John Spencer? At yeah, a little kid. Perhaps he knows before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We John Spencer and Frank Frank Sinclair playing. Yeah. Well, that was a belter for me because I had Frank Spencer playing for 90 minutes in the game. But <laughs> <laughs> some mothers do have <laughs> unusual one. That was Pelly, one of Pelly's best tricks. He jumped the lines and went about when Pelly was playing. Well, he might have been. <laughs> so I remember working with Ian Dark. Um, when we did the Monday night football. And you know how we'd always have these facts and figures when Ron and I just basically do the game. Our job is to, to look at it and, and discuss the tactics and, and everything like that. But of course, the commentators that sit beside us, well, the stats mad. Everything, they have a stat about everything. What he had for dinner, how many kids they've got, when they gave birth, what the weights were, who was present at the birth. They have all these. And I remember we were at Oldham one wet Monday night and we're watching Newcastle play um, Oldham. And... Uh, Somebody goes through against Mike Hooper, and Hooper's in goal, and he comes running out, out with his goal, and he blocks the shot, and, he, and Darkey launches into this thing, and he goes, oh, Mike Hooper, marvellous goalkeeper, he came out, he narrowed the angles, but he would narrow the angles, because he's got a degree, and there was a pregnant pause there, and we were going, oh, no, what's he going to say? Well, he knows his angles, of course, Mike Hooper, he's got a degree in... Uh... Is it maths or English literature? I'm not sure, but... Uh, well, I hope it's maths, because <laughs> he knows his angles. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing will ever match that again. <laughs> He's got a degree in uh, uh, English literature, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will... He's my hero. <laughs> where's the where's the where's the noose? <laughs> Darky, come back. Is there a pipe? Darky. <laughs> and we've all creased myself. And you asked Steve Bruce about this. Steve Bruce was a guest and it was about two minutes before the break. And for the whole of the interval, Steve Bruce was in absolute tears listening to this. So at half time, we're going to the second half, Scott Sellers is playing, and Darky's going, and there's a uh, Scott Sellers, marvellous educated left foot. And I said to Darky, well what's that got a degree in? <laughs> Nice call, read the script, nice call and composed, does the last one, whoops, tucks that one away tidy. We've talked about coming off after a game and somebody not knowing. Do you remember the one the famous one with Gary Newborn at Leeds? Leeds Man U. Let's see. Like... Alex, always a magic place to be when a team gets to Wembley, the uh, winning dressing room. It's fantastic. Uh, it's, well, it's what we wanted all the time and we've played so well all season. I think they deserved it today. They played the football, they kept their composure. And I think, you know, that we deserve to win the game. Well, it was a draw, but you won on aggregate, so you better not confuse people here. Uh, sorry, you won 1-0. Of course you did. It was a late goal. Just, just testing you. Watching. Let's just test you. I always remember that event. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. was a belter. Here's a club. It's just fantastic for us. It's going to be a great day. It's going to be a great joy. Actually, if we can't like Mitchell Thomas here, it's going to be very difficult. It is said. 
out of anybody in here tonight. <laughs> Have you ever in your life ever seen an own goal from this angle? Beautifully judged by Billy Woods of Tranmere. Absolutely precision. Couldn't have done it if he tried. Oh, I remember this one very well. A derby match when I was manager of Man United. And Arthur Alberston cracks home a great goal there. Trouble is, he puts City back on terms. Beautifully. Arthur was very popular. Now this is Hoggy in the box. Once again in my time. Never misses from there, Graham Hogg. Trouble is, he never got any at the other end of the field. Now look at this for a classic. Another derby goal. It's Jimmy Nickel this time, but look at Joe Royal's attitude here. Joe wants to claim it. I've spoke with Big Joe about that. He swears he scored that. Joe was never going to be quick enough to get there. Now when you think of goals, you think of a name Ian Wright. Great goal scorer. Anything in the box is usually his. Reaction, driven shots, reaction, and that's Ian Wright. Unfortunately, it's Ian Wright of Bristol Rovers scoring against his own club. Now let's have a look at this very clinical finish from Julian Hales of Southend. Ball's played wide. Hales is taking up his position. Gets there, tucks it away nicely. Why can defenders always score in the wrong end of the field? Now, coaches spend an awful lot of time on set plays, and here's why. The Warsaw free kick, beautifully aimed into the box. Brilliantly tucked away by Christian Edwards. If you look, you'll see the value of it. they can do, they can apply pressure on an own goal, and that is quite astonishing because it's Ian Dowie who's not got a goal for West Ham in the league this season but he's put the ball past his own goalkeeper Miklosko with a thumping header, it's an embarrassing moment for Dowie a moment of utter glee for the Stockport fans they come back within a minute to fix his goal and it's Ian Dowie of all people they'd have been proud of it at the other end but not at this one the long throw there away by Dix it comes all the way back across flicked on by Armstrong and thumped him by Dowie who simply seemed to forget which end of the goal which end of the field he was at Ian Dowie own goal there's a saying in football if the ball is wide in the last third and you want to score a goal attack the near post and Carlisle's Jamie Richardson does just that and gives Bristol City a goal. I once offered four million pounds plus for Dean Richards. If I knew he could tuck goals like that away, I would have broke the transfer record. And finally, the original and still the best, the goal that made Everton's Sandy Brown a Liverpool legend. Did you, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, you know the man actually, the, the notorious Mad Max. 
Jesus. Uh, Jesus Hill. I mean, you've met him, so you know him. I, I, I only did not meet him. I actually went to dinner with him, which was an experience and a half. And he was eating and talking and drinking yeah. and, and everything was going everywhere. But unbelievable, unbelievable, unbelievable character. And it's probably, probably between the two courses, I bet it's sacked three coaches. <laughs> I tell you, what, I was there. I was there. Somebody said, what was, you know, what was it like when I was in Spain? I said, well, I enjoyed the second week a lot more <laughs> because I was getting the feel of it. I don't know what happened in the third week. I wasn't there that long. But when I looked at the number of coaches he'd had in the period of time he was there, I thought at the end of the day, I was there for about four months. And I thought I should have got a testimonial. I went home to get all my stuff to come back. You know, we were on a good run. We yeah. jumped from bottom to sort of second top, a couple of points beyond Real Madrid. And I get a phone call from Colin Addison, who was my assistant at the time, saying, Ron, they just offered me a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he was both here. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. He got a great personality. I mean, uh, whatever else, he walked into a room. I mean, full marks him. He looks at me, he goes, ah. Oh. My favourite enemy. <laughs> I mean, whatever else. That's a, that's a laugh. That's a like it. I do a lot of people greet you like that, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> what with the big hug of my favourite enemy? Favourite <laughs> enemy. Well, I've had my problems with Chairman Harry. I've worked for a few one-offs, and of course, you work with Sam at Wimbledon. He's very, very much a one-off. There must be, there must be some things about him. You know, there must be some amazing stories about him. When he came over, he liked to have a laugh and enjoy it. And he is, he's good fun, Sam. And I mean, he would come in. He, you know, I mean, he'd do crazy things like race the players for a sort of hundred quid the length of the field. You know, he did want to. To be fair, he'd beat a few of them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the early days, yeah. I've got the pawn king, David Sullivan, terrific. Now, with his partners, no, no. David and Ralph Gold. Yeah. They're, they're three super fellas. Uh, Dave, the two David Sullivan and Gold are football fanatics. Ralph's a boxing man, but they're terrific people. And, I saw um, the thing that drew you there actually was when he said, "I'll get you centerfold in one of his magazines." <laughs> That's what I was thought. I tell you a story I was talking about recently. I think it's the kid Roberts had gone there from Crystal Palace, and he rang up to find out what sort of car the kids got. And I think I think he got something like a BMW convertible. So Sam apparently crept up next day. Sees a BMW convertible in it. Nick's round, lets all the tyres down. As it goes around, there's a little giggle. All of a sudden, Roberts comes out and jumps in a clear or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> when there's somebody else at Birmingham, though? Uh, somebody uh, like. Yeah, the you know, MD, M Karen Brady. She was. Um, she would have sacked me every day for the first year. Oh, my, hang on. She wouldn't have been on her own. There's a lot of chairman would have done that as well, <laughs> honest, be honest with yourself. Yeah. But, I mean, um, Karen was brilliant on the other side. She had a difficult job. Young lady coming into football. The other side of where? Tr trying to rescue Birmingham, yep. who had tremendous potential, but really it was a Kazi. It really, the place was falling to bits. To be honest, when I got the sack, we got on famously, so perhaps that's why I got the sack, I don't know. <laughs> How are you at Man United? That's the best tip. I walked in the dressing room and my boots weren't out. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a message, was Martin Edwards wants to see you. <laughs> I thought there's a clue there somewhere, yeah. yeah. Oh gosh, total disaster. They say you've got to be mad to be a goalkeeper, but certainly a few keepers have sent managers round the bend, particularly with juggling acts like this of Mark Prudhoe of Stoke City. Then there's Bobby Minns. He's kept calling some of the biggest matches at Wembley for Spurs, for Everton. But maybe the sun's a little bit brighter at Mansfield. Now, commanding the box is what it's all about, being a keeper. Dictating, coming and getting everything. Oh, no. Nicky Hammond. Look at that. He's got both hands on the ball. Unfortunately, he's punched it the wrong way. Now, I remember this one very well. One of my first game for West Bromwich Albion and Tony Godden showing how poor he was in the air. I mean, he's made the save. He should have headed it round the corner. Look at that. He's down. He's got everything behind it. It's an easy ball to head away, that Tony. There is another one of my protégés, Gary. Pushes it up over the bar. Oh, no, he doesn't. Stevie Archibald takes full advantage. This must be the nightmare of all nightmares for Kevin Deering. 
puts it down his mate in the crowd blows a whistle no no come on ref gives it back surely you blew no he didn't no good now my son wrong whistle Four marks to the striker, though. He's nipped in nice and bright. But if you're talking about nice, bright strikers, have a look at this one. Now, this is brilliant. George Paris, watch him. It's a pantomime. You can imagine the crowd shouting, he's behind you. That might be the cheekiest goal you've ever seen. Or then again, could it be this one from the city ground, Nottingham? Here's Parker. And it's Crosby coming round the back, and Dibble got it at the second attempt. Oh, and uh, Crosby's pitched the... Oh, has he given the goal? He has! My word! Gary Crosby! And Dibble is livid! And Manchester City have surrounded the referee, Roger Gifford. This is what happened. Well, the ball was only resting on one hand. Was it in his grasp? The referee said no. done as many deals as I have um, you're going to get signings that with the value of hindsight or circumstances they don't work out for you and you, you thought I wish I'd never done that can't get past Nick Holmes on his stronger side Terry Gibson it was an imaginative effort I mean little Terry Gibson um, comes into that category. I mean, to be fair, Terry, he'd been a smashing player. He did very well at Coventry, played in the Cup Final at Wimbledon. So, you know, he did very well. But Old Trafford was just, I felt, was too big for him. In fact, I think sometimes a BMX bike was too big for him. Uh, but he, used to, he came into the club as if he was an autograph hunter. The one I always remember, I was sat in this office down here at, at the Manor Ground, and one had been in London, and he popped in to see me for a cup of tea. And I'm on the, I've got, I'm on the phone to Peter Bordak, who's got a free from Coventry. As I was like, uh, uh, here down the outfit, shines him. Yeah, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to beat the board out of mine. He goes, can I have a word with him? <laughs> I said, go on, have a word with him. He said, I appear, we are coming to Old Trafford tomorrow, I want to have a chat with you. <laughs> and he, he made his mind at the time for United. Or well, the wrong United, Man United. Not I know. The trouble, Remember. Hey, by the way, I did your favour then. <laughs> Don't you worry about it. But that went on a bit long, you know, he came. And he, he was a cocky character, right. wasn't he, when he was yeah. in, when he used to say, I'm, Peter Bodak have goals, yeah, school will, goals, school school have goals will travel or yes, something like that. Yeah. Well, they didn't travel up to Manchester, that's for sure. <laughs> Bodak over the ball and Kevin Bond. Bodak hitting the ball. Away by Thomas. So you saw him just hit Well, <laughs> that was funny. It was ever so funny. Like, he's gone in and Bondy was on about him. For whatever reason, Bondy wanted him. And on the Saturday night, I'd been out with Bondy. Yeah. And he got, he got a black and white, but he had this nice black and white tie that I'd always fancied, you know. And I, to, I said, oh. so he rang me up. He said, would you let Bodak go? I said, well, I'll tell you what, if you let me have that tie, you can have him. <laughs> and he said, go on then, go on, you can have that. So what I did, I walked in at the canteen. The boys had been in the gymnasium at Manu Point, and the boys are going, barmy, Stapleton, and I, they're slaughtering Peter Bodak, who's obviously had a nightmare in the yeah. five or so, and they're slaughtering I said, well, if that's the way you feel, lads. And I walked out, I called him back in, I said, Peter, you've got to go to Manchester City, they want to sign you. Then all of a sudden, stapled and then we, Gaffer, no, it wasn't that <laughs> bad. Like, <laughs> <laughs> can you remember the first time we met in Sheffield? Yeah, I can. We, we was down the uh, Toyota dealer getting our cars, and, yeah. uh, you know, I was uh, getting the club car, they were sorting out a Camry for me, and uh, 
I remember you, me saying to you what you're doing down here for, for, and you said, oh, we're getting a Toyota Supra for Carlton Palmer. And I said to you, well, that won't be a bad swap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, we got a, we had to pay money as well. That's what did me. <laughs> we had to mind the car. We had to give a few quid as well. Yeah, yeah. What about when I transferred you? Oh, I remember that. That was funny. I was sitting at home. He's 47 at the time. I wasn't at home. Well, I was old. I was sitting at home and we said, the phone you, went. If you'd have been a horse. You'd have been ah, shot. I'd have been shot. Your knees were like, yeah. whatever. But it's funny, you phoned so, me and said, uh, I've sold you. I went, oh, thanks a lot, boss. That's hell of an issue. He said, who have you always wanted to play for? And I said, what? Barcelona. <laughs> Milan. Real Madrid. <laughs> I was even high. Man United. Oh, 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 really? And then at the end of it, he was in Glasgow Rangers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that was a belter. You wanted to buy Billy Baldry off me, a young left back who had done well for us in the fourth division. Yeah. But when we got up into the third, because he was part time, he was working That's at Vauxhall Motors, Motors. He wasn't quite up to it. No. <clears throat> the board had also said to me, unbeknown to you, you know, <coughs> Billy Baldry, he's not much use to us now, Ronnie. He's not going to play. Why don't you just give him away and get him off the wage book? And I'm trying to get two grand out of you. <laughs> Go on, you tell your part of the story there. That's the Thursday. Right. When I, I rang you. I got a phone call and. No, it was a, it was a Tuesday, I thought. It, you had a game that night. I got a phone call and you said, Do you still want Bill Baldry? And I said, Ron, I'm desperate for him, but I can't raise a two grand, mate. So you said to me, If I fetch a crate of champagne over to your game that night, I can have him. So I shot out to the cash and carry, got a crate of champagne, picked George Cleary up, who lived, who played for you and, uh, and I. Shot down to Cambridge. Ron, here are, mate, there's your crate of champagne. Basil, he says, I can't do ya. I'm overcharging ya. Have two back. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get honesty in the game like that anymore. <laughs> I gotta tell you, Baz, to be honest. I didn't give you enough change. <laughs> so that's a bit more. You're change. a gentleman, mate. <laughs> Look at that. Such a class at all. And there's a bit more change. Oh, my brilliant. <laughs> Cute one by Ron Atkinson. Well, he's been in the game long enough.